Mm-hmm. Earth science time. We're going to talk today about absolute age dating and fossils. Absolute age dating and fossils. We love fossils. Kind of got, it kind of fell down towards the end, but that's okay. Fossils. And we have a little plus sign here because we're talking about both of those two things, and they are they are different. Um, you are aware we had talked about this before, but um, oops. Boop. Um, you're aware that there are really two kinds of general methods that we use in science to, or in earth science to, to date things. There was we had already talked about relative age dating, right? Which is where what? That's where you relate two things. Yeah, where we relate the ages of two things, right? We use words like this is older than this or this is younger than this. And we had um, four or five principles of relative age dating, which included what are they? Remind me. Uh, the primary and most useful is. Oh. What's the most uh, useful? Superposition. superposition. And then horizontality. Original horizontality. Cross cutting. Cross cutting. The previous second. The inclusions. Inclusions. The one with the chunks. That's inclusions. Inclusions. And then. Lateral continuity. Oh. Lateral continuity. But those are the principles of relative aging that help us understand whether layer X is older than layer Y or fossil X is older than fossil Y. Um, but as we were just talking about in the bell work, we, for any amount of relative age dating we do, we have to have some absolute age dating. Because what this allows us to do, as you know from your vocabulary, is what? What does the absolute age dating allow us to determine? Not the exact age. No. Be careful because that's not, a. Okay. To tell a numerical age. Yeah. But yeah there we go. Might not be a numerical, a numerical age. It's it's always approximate. Like we're never gonna say, you know, at 8:33 p.m. on Friday, June 3rd, 65 million 462,019 years ago. This is what happened. It's never. It's never. When people, this is a problem that comes up a lot in, especially when I teach this to eighth graders. Uh, they're not quite as smart as you. So. Um, but it comes up a lot that they think that this word, which a lot of times in, when we use it in our daily usage, it does mean like exact, you know. But this, that's not what this means. It's as opposed to relative, it means that it's got an actual number of years old. It's usually, it's almost always approximate. That's what I'm going to put here. It is always approximate. Saying it's almost always approximate, that's a lethal out. It is approximate. Um, we, a lot of times it'll even be something like, this little seashell is about... 250 <coughs> mega on them. So that means, how many sig figs are here? If you, if you remember chemistry or if you're in chemistry, just two sig figs, right? If we, re, if we rewrite this number, right, there's a lot of dang numbers here, but only two of them are actually significant. So basically, we're saying that within, how much could this number change and still have it be 250 mega on them? It, it could change, change, it could change up to then, one, it could change five million years. So basically, when we say about 250 mega on them, this means 250 plus or minus five mega on them, right? So this, we, we, it's not exact, it's not exact age dating, it's absolute, meaning that we're giving it an age in years, but it doesn't have to be super precise. In fact, it almost never is super precise. Does that make sense? How can we make this more precise? Yeah, exactly. So if we get a whole pile of these things, that's how we know that the, for instance, the Cretaceous extinction event where the dinosaurs died, it, I say it's about 65 million years ago. There, you can find a more exact date because what has been done is all over the world, all these fossils have been correlated. Remember, they've been compared to other fossils of the same type that are in different locations. They've been correlated and determined that this one we know is greater than 64 mega on. This one is less than 66. And so between those, we have the 65 mega on. And there's, it's more exact than that for that specific event. So how do we do it? How do we find the numerical age? Uh, we know. ask it, how old are you, girl? And then the, it says, it says, I'm 250 minutes. No. I think I'm trying to get you first. Wait, wait, we, we can't really. It's, it's sometimes difficult to do with For bubbles. the, would you look at like the rock layers? Because isn't there a way to tell like age of rocks? Yeah. Just like tree rings, is yep. that their age? The most, the most normal, the, the most commonly used is this idea of radiometric dating. Radiometric dating. That's where you get on Watiki. Like, oh. That's Watiki. No, what? What do you mean? What are those things? Being like the radio. Over. Oh, CB radio. Yeah, and you're like, oh, Watiki. You're yeah. like, over. You're yeah. like, 
Breaker Breaker 19, how old are you, girl? <laughs> yeah, the radio. That's kind of a funny joke, actually, Charlie. But no, that's not what it is at all. Radiometric meaning, referring to what? The radio part of this refers to, not, not, not Breaker Breaker 19. What's the radio mean? Referring to what? What? Yeah, what did you say? Oh, what did you say? Yeah, from nuclear radiation, right? Nuclear radiation. We learned about this. <clears throat> we learned about this when you were a freshman. This is something we I teach the physical science students. Guess what? I also just made a video like last week about this for the current physical science students. So if you have confusion about radiometric, you can watch that, and you don't have to tell anyone. Um, but in, in that video, you, I explained in more detail how exactly we can use this. But it boils down to this: all radioactive isotopes. Is this describing nuclear? Yes. Um, well, it was kind of describing both. All radioactive isotopes. Um, remind me, what's an isotope real quick? This is from chemistry or physical science. What's an isotope? An isotope is unstable. It doesn't have to be unstable. Some of them are. Ra radioactive ones are. Well, what's an isotope? Don't they have different numbers of um, protons? And neutrons and neutrons. Neutrons. They have different numbers of neutrons. So at first we might have, look at the element magnesium. Maybe we have something called magnesium 24, which has 12 oh. protons and 12 neutrons. 12 and 12 is 24. And maybe we also have magnesium 25, which is 12 protons and 13 neutrons. Those would be isotopes. Anyway, all radioactive isotopes have a half Life. You remember this phrase half-life from hopefully from yes. your books, you just did it, but also hopefully from physical science. They have a half-life. This is the amount of time, let's define this real quick. You do have it in your book, but this is the amount of time it takes for 50% of the parent isotope to decay. If it if 50% of the parent isotope has decayed, how much of it is daughter now? Exactly, exactly. And the key, well, the, all this is kind of key, it's a definition, but the, the phrase I want to pay attention to is this amount of time. What kind of units do we use to measure radioactive half-life? If we're talking about an amount of time, what kind of units can we use to measure radioactive half-life? Seconds. Seconds, yep. Minutes, <coughs> yep. Yep, we're, we've got all the time units, right? They're any time unit, but usually, for the ones that are useful for this, the ones that are useful for this, are we going to be using seconds? Probably not. Probably years or even like kilo on a, mega on a. Um, so the ones we, we tend to use are years, kilo on a, mega on a, and giga on a. Those are the ones, these ones are the ones that are useful in geology. The book says, Recall from chapter three. This is the kind of things you always find in textbooks. Can you recall from chapter three? Oh, what's chapter three? Mean? Recall from chapter three that an element is defined by the number of protons it contains. Fine. As the number of protons changes with each which with each emission, because the radioactive decay emits particles, that's why it's called radioactive. Um, the original radioactive isotope called the parent is gradually converted to a different element called the daughter. For example, a radioactive isotope of uranium-238 will slowly decay into the daughter isotope lead-206 over the span of time. Um, look with me. There's a little chart here on page 601 describing the decay of uranium-238. Uranium-238, you remember this notation? Symbol and then the mass number in the corner. Uranium-238, it goes through a lot of different other daughters, right? The first one is thorium-234. It goes through a lot of different other daughters until it eventually becomes lead 206. And every one of these different daughters takes a certain amount of time to decay. And altogether we can tell how long it takes. So what we do is we look at a rock or a fossil that is now made of rock, and we'll talk about fossils in a second. But we look at a rock and we see, oh, this is about 50% uranium-238 and about 50% lead-206. And we already had determined how much time it takes for that to occur, and so we can say that this rock is that many years old, however long one half life is. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. It's, it gets a little bit more complicated than that because there's, a, there's an equation that we use to determine, because almost never is it like we look in the little rock with our spyglass and we see, oh, 50-50. It almost never happens that way. So there is an equation that we talked about in that video that I mentioned um, that tells us how much time has passed if we found, for instance, 83% parent oh, and 17% daughter. It's not in the book? It's not in the book. 
and you won't have to worry about it for your test. But just in, in case you're interested, there is a method to um, determining how much time has passed for any percentage. It's not even that difficult. I think it is. This is supposed something we should actually talk about, but I'm not. We're not going to. But it's the um, half life times. No, no. It's the log of the mass that's left over divided by the mass that was initially there. Um, the log base 0.5. You always know about logarithms? Don't worry about it. What? So actually, oh, I'll wait till we get to fossils. Do you know about logarithms? No. Do you really? You guys yeah. know about logarithms? Good. Because yeah. I asked the freshmen and they said, never. I don't, I don't know. know. You probably have I don't think you learned it until no, like algebra 2, two pre-calc. Yeah. Yeah. So two just two. to clarify a couple things, what, um, as time goes on, any radioactive isotope, how does the percent parent change? What? How does the percent, it what? You even know, how, how does it change over time? Like, if it starts at 100%, how does it change over time? The parent isotope, it decreases, right? And how does the daughter isotope change over time? It increases. Look at the chart on page 602. You'll find it, there's a neat little curve for the parent isotope, percent parent and percent daughter on this one, the percent parent decreases over time, and the percent daughter increases over time, but it's not linear. How would you describe this function? Um, yeah, that's, that's not quite right, but you're going to Here's the first letter. E. Oh, I was going to say uh, X, but E. X. X. Exponential. exponential. This is exponential what? No, decay. This is exponential decay. In fact, it, th these things are called that because radioactive decay, exponential decay. This one is exponential growth. They're both asymptotes. This one never quite reaches zero, zero and this one never quite reaches zero. Uh, no. 100. 100. 100. They never, it, it's just never, and this, I drew this one wrong. I'm sorry. This one should be like this. There we go. Oh, okay. That's better. Now, you, now that made it all clear. Um, You'll need to read a little bit more about that in order to do a good double your test. And then your book also talks about other ways to do absolute age dating, which is ice cores, tree rings, and barbs. Mm, know those definitions, which you already should from your vocab. Other than that, we're going to move on. Do you have questions about radiometric dating? To boil it all down even more simply, we look at the rocks, we learn how much of the radioactive isotope, and compare it to the daughter isotope, and that can tell us how much time has passed since that rock was formed. Okay. Oh, one last thing. Don't compare, don't, don't confuse this with something called carbon dating. You all have heard of carbon dating. I, I'm over here. Oh, no, that's right. Carbon dating. Carbon dating is a type of this, but look at this. Carbon dating is only useful for about 10 half-lives, which is for carbon, it's about 57,300 years. Can we, so will this be useful for, for instance, for dinosaur bones? No. No. They're much, 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 much freaking older than this, or a thousand times older than this. So what is this useful for? This could be with, like, rocks? No. Rarely. Dead people? Okay, they're exactly right. Dead people. Human beings. Human civilization, specifically. Human beings have existed for about a quarter of a million years. Human civilization has existed for about 40,000. So this, carbon dating, is useful in archaeology, where we're talking about human civilization. Like, we're like, oh, look at this neat pottery from the China. Uh, how, how old is it? And then they're like, oh, I'll do some science and I'll figure it out. And they're like, oh, it's 19,000 years old. So Great, the China was 19,000. Whatever. It's not useful for dinosaurs or squids or shells or anything like that because it's, it, this just doesn't, there's not a, it, it decays too fast, right? For this, we use things like uranium-238. Your book has a list of the ones we actually use. Uranium-238, rubidium-87, potassium-40, uranium-235. It's, it's all beautiful. I, I really, I think this is a neat and interesting way um, to determine the ages of things in the past. And this is interesting for archaeology, but we don't use this for paleontology, almost never. So there is some overlap. Fossils are all considered fossils if they're more than 10,000 years old, generally. And so there could be like maybe like a mammoth or a saber-toothed tiger we might use carbon dating to figure out how old that thing was. Um, but generally not. Generally, for most fossils, we have to use some other kind of radiometric data. Questions about radiometric dating? You, Scott, do you have a question about radiometric dating? No. You guys have questions about dating at all? Yeah, I need some advice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I set you up for that, Leo. I'm surprised it took you all so long. You guys are kind of slow to date. What is the Ouch. advice that you need? <laughs> how, to, how to make the girl think I smell good? Well, that's a good question, Levi. Take a shower consistently. 
No, I don't think that's good advice. <laughs> I think get some really get take some it, get some it, fries it. in your car and leave them there for a long time and then sit in that for a while. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so the next thing we're going to write down, well, I've already written up here fossils, so write down fossils. And the first thing we're going to talk about fossils is what what up with fossils? So maybe write that down. Okay, actually, can I ask my question? Can you stop erasing sideways? Excuse me. <laughs> I can't leave it because it doesn't erase if I don't do it well, sideways. Tylee, 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 ask your question. So since there's like convection and the plates are constantly moving, mm -hmm. so does that mean quite a bit of the fossils were like almost like burned up? Like if you think yes. about it, they were in the ground and Heck then yes. plates. So yep. there's probably more than more fossils than we even know of because of how often the earth was moving. Heck yes, Tyler. That's exactly right. In fact, that's how come we know. Um, if you look at the little geologic time scale, look at the geolog look at the geologic time scale real quick. Um, you'll look see at it. we have more detail, significantly more detail in the ages and epochs of the um, Phanerozoic and specifically the Cenozoic, because over time even fossils degrade, right? Yeah. The Proterozoic, the Phanerozoic is all three of the other ones. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic are all the Phanerozoic. Anyway, um, yeah, so fossils do get destroyed. There are way fewer fossils from the Archean than there are from the Holocene. I was watching Ice Age when like the Earth was just like moving, <laughs> and I was looking like, man, what does that happen to like the fossils in real life? Yeah, I do. And they all it's just died. died. And what if also yeah. they had they all just died. Okay, um, so fossils. <laughs> Fossils are useful for a couple reasons. Uh, this is the example I always use. There, uh, this is in the other video I made for the eighth graders, and I, I really like this example. So pretend, do a little thought experiment with me for a second. Pretend there's coyote running across the football field. Coyote. Coyote. And Colby shoots it. Colby gets out his 30 out six and blows it to smithereens. And then, and then we just, and then we just leave it there, and no one touches it. All those move it. We go around it during the football games. No one touches it for a, for a year, for one year. What's going to be left of it? Try again. Flesh. Everyone's everyone's it's always wrong. What did you say? I said nothing. Nothing. Not a single thing. The the little know? the fur would float away. The the critters the critters will eat the soft chewy bits a year. Seriously. I I the bones die two years ago. Yeah, listen, not not always, but listen. Listen, usually there was a dead deer, um, someone hit with their car last in twenty eighteen in the August. I remember because it would like it was bloated and it was like its legs were coming apart because That's it was like it was, it was very gross. I had to walk by it every time I went to walk my dog. No, really and then bad. now, and that was so I guess that was almost two years ago, about a year and a half ago, there's absolutely nothing left. Because even How the bones a little up? critter no no no, they did not. A little critter, a squirrel will eat the bones. It is disgusting, but they do. The squirrel will eat the bones. Okay, Mostly, why, why usually, shh, listen, 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 listen. Usually nothing will be left. About about somewhere between about one percent to five percent of organisms, right? Well, the stuff I guess my cats organisms. are real good. Great. One About one percent to five percent of organisms can become shh, can become fossils. Usually, so obviously, maybe more than maybe in twenty years, you think there'll be anything left, or a hundred, or three hundred years, you think the cow's bones will be left there? No, no of course not. But because it's not a fossil, most <laughs> of the time, listen, most of the time, even if it takes a thousand years, that's not a fossil, right? Remember, fossils have to be more than ten thousand years old. Most of the time. Things don't become fossils. Yes, Maddie. Okay, so my dad had a raccoon like right outside of town. Great. And it's still there. Okay. But it was like a long time ago. That's fine. But in a thousand no, years, it's not going to be there. I, the I squirrel ate the most things, things, and everything is still on. Most things don't become fossils, so please write that down. Okay. It's very rare for an object to become a fossil. Maybe it's we extremely should say, but rare. But that doesn't mean it's gone within one year. No, but usually it is. It's so very rare for a thing to become a fossil. You're telling me that if we wanted a larger squirrel, Population, we could just stop burying people and let them eat people's bones. Uh, uh, no, that, yeah, that's probably working. <laughs> they get nice uh, and fat. Not just squirrels. Everything, even like a deer will eat bones. Things that need calcium that oh. don't eat meat will eat bones. They will just chew so on them. You see a dog chew on them? That's exactly yeah. what it does. Anyway, so most things don't become fossils. In order for something to become a fossil, shh, in order for something to become a fossil, in order for an organism to become Fossilized. What? What? What probably has to happen? Usually, not always, but usually. I would say like a large layer of rock. Yes, it must be. Almost immediately. And what do we call it when a large layer of rock is laid down on top of a crater? Like preserve it. Yeah, but we call that something special. There's a verb that's somewhere over here somewhere. Buried. It must be buried. 
rapidly. This is, like I said, this is not always the case, but usually it has to be buried. Either while it was still alive, like dying, like maybe it died in a mud flow, or a tar pit, for instance, or right after it died. In order for an organism to become fossilized, it must be buried rapidly. Um, yeah, when your pet dies, yeah, you bury that's what. Pet. Yeah, so some, there's probably going to be some human fossils eventually, but it takes a long dang time because the, so the primary method, the primary method of fossilization. We're going to write down these methods of fossil, fossilization. Methods of fossilization. The rarest, and we're going to start with this one, is original soft parts. This is exceedingly rare. Um, both of these, your book combine these both into original preservation, the first two we're going to talk about. And I'm not going to make a huge description about these because they're pretty self-explanatory. For instance, self-explain what original soft parts means. Like flesh? Yeah, like the stuff that Air? it was the stuff it was actually made of that's soft, its liver, right, its skin, its eyeballs. That would count as original soft parts. It, it, so yeah, exactly. So it can be preserved. For instance, how your book gives a good example in the picture. How can that ever be preserved? Maybe it was in a cave. Okay, there's about I really can think of three ways that original. Remember, a fossil has to be greater than ten thousand years old. So how could we preserve the eyeballs of something for ten thousand years? There's really only three Water, ways. Water, so Put them in a solution. It was no, look at the picture. What's the the most common way? Is yeah, amber, amber, which is what we call hardened sap. Amber is the is usually the way. What else? There's two others. What else could preserve it indefinitely? Ice. Yep. Yeah, if it's frozen, good job, Hannah. One other. She's not a robot. Hannah, you go. Did you say tar? Yeah. Hannah, not a wall. Those are the three ways. I can, the only three ways I can do there. I'm sure there are at least some others. Listen, please. Shh. I'm sure there are at least some others. But the only ways that soft parts can get preserved to be a fossil, which has to be greater than 10,000 years old, if it's preserved in amber. If it's preserved in tar or if it's frozen, um, mm -hmm. mammoth fossils. We can, we they have fa they have found mammoth fossils with meat on them, and then they ate the meat because it was Ew. frozen. It, they said it tasted bad. I didn't try it. Um, <laughs> but then also, this is I think this is the coolest thing. But there have been there's only as far as I know one example of this. But there has been a fox, a dinosaur found with original soft parts. It had feathers. It had, oh, they found a skin so and feathers nice. and organs and muscles. We know so much more about how dinosaurs are preserved now because one, one day a sad little dinosaur got trapped in some tree sap and then that became amber and ah. it had feathers. And we now know for certain that dinosaurs have feathers because we have an example of it. I bet it was dying. Can we was like, like, we will in a second, things. but we'll do it after the video. So the other way, and this is much more common, is original hard parts. Mm. I bet those are like the way that finds hard parts. Like bones. bones, teeth, beaks? claws, beaks, yeah. This is much more common, but still, both of these together are very, 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 very rare. When you find, a, when, when, if you found what's called a dinosaur bone, like if you said, oh, this is a dinosaur bone, or if you went to the museum, like, look at that dang dinosaur bone. It's not actually a dinosaur bone. Um, that's extremely rare. What actually happens almost all the time it's is this wrong. third one, which is petrification. I'm going to include all these together. Recrystallization. and permineralization. Um, there are differences between these. I don't remember, I don't think on your test I differentiate between these, but your book does. Petrification, recrystallization, and permineralization. How many is there? Three. Crystallization. Your book lumps these all into mineral replacement. Recrystallization. Mineral replacement. Oh, just the last one. Permineralization. Oh, I didn't. And then this is almost self-explanatory too. If it was mineral replacement, what do you think is happening? It's replacement. Exactly. Like so the bone is like right. Fed. So there's a dinosaur bone, back when the dinosaur died and was eaten by its, its friends, and every every part of every organism has holes in it. There, everything has little pore spaces, and so over time, over time those holes, because it was rapidly buried, this is why rapid burial is almost always necessary, because in the very few amount of organisms that ever actually become fossils, most of them that become fossils, this occurs with. When they get buried, the sediment that makes up whatever they were buried in fills in these little holes over time. And then eventually, as always happens, the bone itself goes away. Let me draw more of these dots. The bone itself goes away, and all that's left behind is the minerals that we're filling in the holes, right? So then if I erase the bone, you can still kind of tell it was bone shaped. And so what we end up with is a fossil, right? It's actually a literal rock, but it's in the shape of whatever it was filling in, right? So we still see 
we still see the bone, except now it's a rock instead of bone. So when, so when I go to like a museum, they're not real bones? And also, when you go to a museum, they're probably plaster casts because they don't want people touching the actual bones. So what they do is then they make a, a mold out of the permineralized bone, yep, and then they fill it with plaster, and then they take the plaster out and they put that in the museum. And that gets us to our last thing, which is called molds and casts. This happens in nature, but we, uh, what I just talked about happened obviously in a museum. But a mold is an imprint left by an organism. So there's some soft mud or clay or something. And yeah, there's maybe a footprint or a, a shell or the organism's entire body, and it makes a hole in the shape of that organism. That's a mold. So we can say that the mold is a hole. A hole. A depression. Yeah, that's a lovely word. Depression is beautiful. There's a mold that's a hole, and then a cast is formed if sediment comes along and fills in that hole, and the cast is the shape of the organism itself. So the cast is a fill in. Um, your book talks about index fossils next, which is, if you know the definition of index fossils, you'll be fine. And that is, that's all I've got what about fossils. Oh, listen, I almost said that's all I've got about fossils. That's not true. I can talk to you for literally you 20 and a half hours about fossils. But this is the most basic information about fossils. Index fossils are those fossils that only lived for a short period of time, and they were all over the world. And so when we see one, we're like, oh, that Inoceramus, for instance, that Inoceramus must have been from the Mesozoic. Like oh, anytime okay. we see him, we know what era that rock common, is. Common, small, and only in an area. Not necessarily small, but common, oh, worldwide. Worldwide. Um, and they only lived for a short amount of time. Because if they lived for like from the beginning of time until now, we're like a shark, for instance, we're like, well, it's a shark, but it could have been anywhere from the Paleozoic to now. I keep saying the like stupidest stuff, and it's like we just found a shark that's been alive for like. 3.8 billion years and it was in a cave. Mm. And I was like, TikTok? You probably mean like the shark species has been around for three years. No, it meant the shark. And well, I just showed don't, really don't get your science intro from TikTok. I would really recommend against that. <laughs> you have questions about fossils? <laughs> Does anyone have one question about a fossil? Yeah, What's question. your favorite one? Do you think, thank you. Do you think fossils are cool? Yes. yes. My favorite fossil is probably like the one it. about the dinosaur that got trapped in the amber. We're looking at it right now. Yes. Do you have questions about absolute age dating? Do you understand how all four of these things Relative age dating, geologic time, absolute age dating, and fossils. All of them work together to help us learn about the past. Because we can't go there, it's done. We can't, I went to Arby's yesterday. I can't, I can't ever go back to Arby's, they kicked me out. That's not true. But I can't ever go back to that day I went to Arby's, right? I can't go back in time. I wish I could, but I can't. Same way, we only can learn about this stuff by finding evidence of it now. Okay? Okay. Bye! Have you ever watched the